It's good to be here tonight. Good to have everyone here tonight. Got a couple coming in, so we'll wait just a minute. Let's have a prayer. Our Father and our God, Father, we thank you so much for everything you do for us, for all the blessings you bless us with, Father, for your Son that came to this earth, gave us an example, and, and died for our sins, and, and gave the sacrifice that we couldn't give, Father, and then rose again to defeat death. Father, for the church that he established, for each one that, that's here that's a member of the church at this location, Father, we, we thank you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ability you, you gave us to, to study your word, to seek out the things that you would have us to do. And Father, as we study your word tonight, help us to take it and, and apply the things that we learn to our lives and, and help us to be better servants, Father. Father, we ask you to be with all those that are unable to be here. We ask you to Help them to regain their health or, or whatever the hindrance might be, Father. Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins. We pray that you'll always help us to be willing to repent of those things that we've done against your will. Father, be with us as we study. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The word grace is a word that we're very familiar with. If, if you look in our song books, we have many, many songs that talk about grace, amazing grace. Uh, God's grace reaches me just over and over again. There, there are many, many songs. And, and in the scriptures, the uh, word grace is very, very important to us as Christians because we're told that we're saved through grace. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this word tonight, what it means and, and what happens. Uh, the Apostle Paul loved to use the word grace. He used it in every one of the epistles that we know that he wrote. In the, uh, basically, he, he begins and ends with something to do with grace. An example is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be to you and peace. And then he ends that same book, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And we talk about this word and, and we I think we all understand the word and so this is kind of just a, a refresher. But... Uh, what does the word grace actually mean? Unmerited favor. What does that mean? Don't deserve it. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Zoll. I don't know who he is. He's an author. But in one of his writings, he said, Grace is unconditional love toward a person who does not deserve it. Which is what we just said, but he... he Puts it out rather succinctly in that. So the, the word in, in the Hebrew used in the Old Testament was the word chesed, and that basically means to speak of deliverance from, from enemies and from affliction. In the New Testament, the Greek word used is charis. That's the word that's translated to, to uh, grace. The original idea of the word, as they were used in both the Greek and the Hebrew biblical terms, refers to goodwill, loving kindness, favor, in particular to God's merciful grace. It's used over 140 times in the New Testament. So again, grace is, is a very important concept for us to know and, and to understand. In a lot of the passages in the New Testament, it's, it's not used just as a description of, of the way that we're saved, but it's also used in, in reference to speech. In Luke chapter 4, 
verse 22 says, So I bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Ephesians 4.29 again tells us that, that the words of the Christian are, are to impart kindness and, and grace and favor to the ones who hear the words. Uh, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. This is much like the, the passage that tells us when we correct someone that is overtaken in a fault, to do it with, with gentleness and love. And this, this is the same idea when it's talking about using grace uh, or giving grace to those who hear. The uh, New Testament writers use the word charis or grace preeminently uh, of the kindness by which God bestows favors even upon those who don't deserve it and grants to sinners the pardon of their offenses and bids them acceptance of etern- bids them to accept eternal salvation through Christ. Refer to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5. So this is what makes us think of the, of the word or, or the description unmerited favor. You know, in Genesis, uh, the first, well, in chapter 5 and 6 of, of Genesis, when uh, God was describing the, the state of the world at that time and said that every thought of the heart was evil. And then in verse 6, or excuse me, verse 8 of Genesis chapter 6, he said, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So again, that, that's a good thing. And we know that because of that, Noah and his family were the only ones that were saved in, in the great flood that wiped out the world at that time. Yes, sir. That was not a concept that was that was taught. And why did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Because because he obeyed God, he didn't question God, and he did what God would have him to do. So God rewarded him and his family. Romans chapter five tells us that that when we accept God's grace, that we are in a a state of grace. Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 1, says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in in hope of the glory of God. God offers grace... To all men. We, we see that in the scriptures. Does that mean that all men are saved because God offers grace to his grace to all men? What do we have to do? We, we have to accept that grace by obeying his commandments, don't we? In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul is is talking there in his letter to to Timothy and he's talking about the fact that, that he accepted this grace and he is thankful to Christ because Christ enabled him to do what he's uh, been able to do. Of course, we know that in Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 4, that salvation is always a matter of grace. 
Starting at verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the miserable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Again, that unmerited favor, the gift of God. God doesn't owe us anything. What we deserve is eternal damnation because as we're told in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So salvation and the promises that God offer us is a gift. He offers it again to all men in the latter part of, of Romans uh, 6 and 23, he says, But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, a lot of people read some of these passages and believe they don't really have to do anything but believe in God and they're going to be saved and that they can never fall from grace. And as we read the scriptures and we see what God has to say about this and what what the, the New Testament tells us about this, we know that this is totally untrue. But there's a, there's a world of people out there that I think really believe that because they say that there's a God in heaven and that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that because they believe that and they say that, they can do anything they want to do and live any way they want to live. And when they die, they believe they'll go to heaven. That's right. But they believe and tremble, as the Scripture tells us. No matter what God may call upon us to do in order to receive His grace, when we do these things, then we will receive it. And as Aidan said a while ago, the... Uh, commandments that we have to obey the gospel, to hear the word, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, to repent of our sins, to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and to be baptized for the remission of our sins, and then to live according to the commandments that we have in the scriptures. These, these are the ways that we contact this grace and we accept this grace that, that God offers. And even when we do that, we, we still can't say that we earned or merited our salvation because uh, the Scriptures tells us in Luke chapter 17 and 10 that we're still unworthy servants. It says, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. There's no other way to be saved other than through the grace of God and through accepting His grace by, by obeying His commandments. In Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 4, Scripture there says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It says, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Does this mean that we as Christians can hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, come sit in church every time the doors open and expect to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's, that's not the way it works. In uh, 
in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse, well, I'll go back to verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he tells us that we, we can't work our way into heaven, but what do we do with our good works? What does that show? What, what does that do for us? We're not, we're not, again, we're not working our way in heaven and we can never deserve, deserve that. But turn over to uh, James chapter 2. Verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. It's a difficult concept for some people to grasp when you're trying to to teach someone that, that we are saved by grace, that we can't work our way into heaven but that God does require us to show our faith by the things that we do in his vineyard and by the works that we, that we do. God's grace requires, requires us to, to live holy. Uh, there, were, there were people in, in the uh, church at Rome that Paul was preaching to in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 saying, well, you know, we might as well keep on sinning so that grace may abound, so that we can have more grace. And in Romans 6, chapter 1, Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I like the King James Version for this. It says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So that's grace is, is not a license to keep on sinning, but we should live holy as, as God has, has taught us to live, as the example that Jesus gave us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So that's the patterns that we, that we live by. Paul wrote in Titus chapter 2 that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly, Starting in verse 11 of of Titus chapter 2, he says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul explains why Jesus gave himself for us, why he offered this this grace, because Jesus would redeem us from every lawful deed. If you read on in verse 214, he says, uh, well, let me go back to 13. 
or the latter part of 13, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. There comes that word works in there again, good works. So that's the way that God expects us to live, to, to take advantage and, and to accept this grace that, that he gives us. The unmerited favor of God is no excuse to go on sinning, just, just as Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. In Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 12, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as much in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We can't do this on our own. We, we have to have God. We have to have God's help, his strength to help us to live soberly and righteously and godly. Philippians 4.13 is, is a verse that the whole world is, is familiar with. I can do all th things through him who strengthens me. And, and we recognize that, that Paul was, was talking there about the fact that he had been at rock bottom and he'd been on the top of the world and that, that he had learned in whatever state that he was in that he could be content and that with God's help, he could uh, do whatever he needed to do. If we go back to verse 11 of chapter 4 of Philippians, he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't remember the guy's name that... Uh, Zig Ziglar, is that the guy that wrote the book based on this verse? Is, is I, that may be right and it may be wrong. I, I can't remember. But he made a lot of money off of, of writing a book based on Philippians 4.13 using that scripture as something to say that God, in, in whatever we do, God is going to help us and give us the strength to do that. Is that what the scripture is saying? Not in whatever you do. In, in God's will, whatever we do in God's will, then God will help us to do. But uh, he, he used it as more of a secular thing uh, in his book. That was kind of required reading in one of my business classes in college. And uh, he had some good points in there, and it, it, was a, it, it was for the most part a positive book, but he... He twisted the scriptures around a little bit for his use in that book. And uh, we, we need to always remember that, that, that the promises that God makes us, whatever those promises are, they're always according to his will and that his will be done. Not our will unless our will coincides with his. So something that, that we all, always must remember Scriptures tell us that we, we need to grow in grace. If we're going to live holy lives, Peter tells us to do this in uh, uh, 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. It's not enough just to experience the grace of God in having our sins forgiven when we're baptized into Christ. But Ephesians chapter 2 says that so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What's he talking about here? 
What other promises do we have in, in Christ? A heavenly home? How do we grow in grace? Peter tells us by to, to continue to grow in grace. So, so how do we grow in grace? Study. Second Timothy two fifteen, and again, I like the uh, the King James version for this. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Acts chapter two or Acts chapter twenty. And verse 32 says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. How does the word of God build us up? Is a Christian life a, a hard life to lead? He did say he gave us a helper. That's exactly right. James is pretty clear, the, the passage that we read a little earlier in, in James is pretty clear that uh, faith only doesn't get the job done. And uh, unfortunately, that's, that's the concept that the world has. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. What happens to us as we learn more about God's Word? You want to do more? What happens to our prayer life? What happens to the things that are important to us? Do they grow more in line with what God would have us to do? We, we can trust in God. You know, as, as I look out over the crowd, uh, there's a few people here that if, if I ask if you're below a certain age, you could raise your hand, but there's not too many people here that can do that. We... Uh, so uh, many of us have, have lived many more years in the past than, than we have to look forward to in the past. Does it give us peace to understand the promises that God's made to us? Does it give us peace to know that if, if we're faithful, if we continue in his word, if we do the things that he has told us that we should do, that we're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of, of my father? Does that, does that give us some comfort? Make your request known to God. Right. Do you ever wonder how someone who, who really doesn't believe in God, who really doesn't believe that there's a heaven, well, maybe they believe there is a heaven, but they don't really believe there's a hell. There's a lot of people out there that, that feel that way because God's just not going to be uh, 
as, as they call it. God's not going to be that mean uh, the, the way they look at it. Do you wonder how they feel when they're approaching, uh, when, when they go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, you know, this is really getting bad. I, I, you need to get your affairs in order. Can you imagine that? Can, can you imagine being in that condition? And maybe it doesn't bother some people. I don't know. You know, Peter tells us that we're to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within us. Is, is that hope a, a burning hope that we want to spend eternity to heaven in heaven and we're willing to do whatever it takes for us to be able to do that? Do, do we have that hope? And are we, are we able to give a defense for the hope that we have? If we don't study very much, we're not able to give a defense for the hope that we have. If we study, then, then we know. We know what we did, and we can tell people what we did and, and why we did it. Again, growing in grace, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. All things that pertain to life and godliness are in the Scriptures. That's, that's the reason that Paul gave us the, the instruction to, to study. Study to know what God would have us to do. Study to be a workman that, that needs not to be ashamed. Study to know how to decipher what the Bible says and, and how to rightly divide the word of truth. So again, that's, that's the way that we grow in grace. We also draw near to God in prayer. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Can we receive God's grace in vain? Do people receive God's grace in name? Paul thinks so. He begged the Corinthians that they not receive God's grace in vain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 1, We then as workers, together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Again, some receive God's grace in vain because they fail to understand God's instruction. They understand, they fail to understand what, what God expects. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I, I believe I said something a little earlier about there's many, many religious denominations that teach that you can't fall from grace. They call it the eternal security of the believer. That once you're saved... Once, once you make those steps and, and become a Christian, that, that you cannot be lost. 
at that point. If that's the case, why does Paul warn us to take heed lest we fall? In James chapter 5 and verse 19, My brethren, if any of you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death. Sounds to me like you can fall away. Sounds like that can happen. Paul tells us that he has to, to work on himself every day. Hebrews or 1 Corinthians 9 and 27 says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We're told to, to examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith. If we, if we can't fall from grace, why are we given these ad, admonitions? Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 1, says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Why would Paul tell us these things? Why would the Holy Spirit tell us these things? The helper that Herschel was talking about a while ago. Why would they tell us these things if, if it was not possible to fall? So we, we know that it is. Paul was talking here to the Christians in Galatia that were trying to uh, go back to the law of Moses to try to, to pull some of the old law in and, and mix it in with, with what they knew about Christianity. And we have a, a whole set of denominations that do that today. They, they want to bring things that Christ says were nailed to the cross and they want to bring those over and, and use those in conjunction with, with what God tells us to do today. If we seek to be justified by any system of salvation by works alone, we will fall from grace. In Jude chapter, well, in Jude verse 4, I guess it is chapter 1, but it's Jude verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11 tells us how God's grace requires holy living also. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. tells us to, to be about good things and, and not to be about things that can bring up strife and, and division. We can fall from grace if we are willful in sin, if we're impenitent about those sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his, peop his people. It's a fearful thing 
to fall into the hands of the living God. That's why we want to be faithful. That's, that's why we want to live according to the way that he tells us to live. He, he tells us for, for some, one such as that, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But we do have some, some good news to, uh, to offset that. Because in 1 John chapter 1, starting at verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 13 and 9 says, For it's good that the heart be established by grace. And Hebrews 13, 25 again says, Grace be, be with you all. Amen. Our, our job as Christians is to receive this grace. And, and just as we don't just confess Christ one time, we confess Christ every day with the actions that we do and, and the activities that we partake in, we either confess Christ or we deny Christ by the things that we do every day. And by the same token, the things that we do every day, we either accept God's grace or we, re or we reject God's grace. He tells us that he's there, he's with us. And Paul says that we can do all things through him, and we can. If we rely on him, if we trust him. I'll be glad when my new glasses show up. I'll be able to see something with great regularity then, I hope. Good to see each of you, and, and good to have the opportunity, isn't it, to gather together with people of a like precious faith and to uh, study God's word together and encourage each other. Um, I'm hoping, and I know that you're hoping, and in fact, we are praying that uh, our vaccines will be effective and the other measures that we're taking will, will be helpful and that pretty soon we can uh, resemble, uh, resemble, resume our activities. Yes, sir. I've got that. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm, that's good. Think with me for just a minute or two about Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. You're familiar with the passage. Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Here's an amazing thing. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. They followed him all the way. On that occasion, of course, that's the call that Jesus gives to these brothers. Immediately after Having called these two, he calls James and John relatively the same way. John chapter 4, I think about verse 21 beginning. And this call, become fishers of men, you know, is a, a metaphor. What he's calling them to do is come with him and preach the gospel. Declare God's word. And just prior to the Lord's ascension, when he went back and assumed his position at the right hand, of his father, he sent them forth into the world. Previous to that, he'd sent them forth on a limited commission. And then just before the ascension, he sent them forth on the great commission and said, go preach the gospel. Go preach the gospel. You know, that's our mission. Not every disciple will be a, pro a public proclaimer. Not everybody has an inclination to do that. Not everybody has a skill set to do that. Not everybody has the knowledge that is necessary in order to do that in a credible way. 
Uh, John, uh, James, rather, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such, that is, as teachers, we will incur a stricter judgment, as a teacher should, because you have people's lives in your hands. So he, he, he himself cautions and lets us know that not everybody will fulfill that role. Further, not everyone, even among those who declare the gospel, will go into all parts of the world. However, after I had made that notation, I thought about how many of my brethren that I went to school with that made preachers, and we're now all uh, older. And it's amazing to me how many of them traveled a good portion of the world preaching the gospel. But not even everybody that does that. Some will just stay local and do good work for the Lord. Yet the point I want us to get is that everybody can help lead others to Christ in some capacity. Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Paul wrote, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. He's talking about a good example there. He's talking about living the life before the community. And he said, do that, brethren. Please do that. We, we do that by being ready to tell everyone that asks a reason for the faith that we have within us. First Peter 3 and verse 15. He said, you maintain a readiness and a willingness to give an answer to people that ask you about why it is that you believe as you believe. And to accomplish that further, we have to be judicious and discreet and courteous in the declaration of truth. I, I have known a few of our brethren that thought they had to be mean to be truthful. And, you know, if it's just so counterintuitive that they don't appear to realize that when you're discourteous to people and you're dismissive of people, they're going to resist you. You're not going to have very much success with them and very much impact on them. Colossians 4 and verse 6 says, Let your speech be always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Though none of us are apostles, and most are not preachers, we all have an opportunity to help lead others to Christ. I just wanted all of us to be admonished tonight with this fact that we should never doubt the power of the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And beyond that, never betray its principles. Let us be resolved that we'll not do that. First John chapter 1, but again verse 5, Brother Paul, uh, John writes, this is the message that we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Let's conduct ourselves always in this community in a way that our Souls are continually cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus. If you're here tonight as a Christian and there's some burden upon your soul, it may not be a sin burden. There are a lot of other burdens that are heavy on people. But if we can help you with a sin problem or some other spiritual problem by going with you into the presence of God, we'd be honored to do that. If you're here and you're not yet a Christian, I would urge you don't leave this house outside of Christ because we never know when he's coming. His coming is imminent. It could be today, tomorrow, the next day, but he shall return. We want to be ready for him when he comes. And if you've not named his name as a penitent believer and submitted to the act of baptism for the remission of sins, please do that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful to have had this opportunity midweek to
hear more of your word and, and uh, also have the opportunity to join in songs and praise to you. We're thankful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We just ask that you be with us now as we depart. Keep us safe. Help us to go out into the world and make a difference and bring others closer to you. Forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.